Do we still know how to speak with each other? Do we still know how to argue, to debate, to persuade? Can we still learn from other, one another? Or is even the thought of engaging with someone who disagrees with you passe? So 20th century, so quaint, so European, so colonial, so patriarchal. Do we still know how to study? Do we attend school to open our minds to new ideas? Or to reinforce what we think we already know? Do teachers inspire us to think freely? Or do they seek to impose a dogma, a creed, one acceptable view? Do we seek out other opinions? Or do we spend all of our time in the echo chamber with those who already agree? There's a fascinating statement in the Talmud. Tanurabanan, our sages taught, Al shlosha hakadosh baruchu boche alehem bechol yom. There are three types of people for whom the Holy One weeps every day. Al shef sharla sok betorave osek. God weeps for the one who is able to engage in study and does not. Al she'ifshar la'asok betorah ve'osek. God weeps for the one who is unable to engage in study and nonetheless does. Ve'al parnas ha'mitgayar ha'tzibur. And God weeps for a leader who lords it over the community. The Talmud doesn't elaborate on these three types of people. Who are they? Are they related? How is an arrogant ruler connected with one who studies but shouldn't and one who doesn't study but should? What is so egregious about their behavior that it causes God to weep every day? I'm glad you asked. I'll tell you. Let me address each of the three categories of people. One. God weeps for those who are able to engage in Torah and do not. Learning is among the highest of Jewish values. The study of Torah exceeds all other commandments our sages teach. Study day and night, the Bible commands. God weeps for those who are able to engage in study, who have both the intellectual capacities and the opportunities, and do not. Why? Because the stakes are so extraordinarily high. Ideas, values, rational thought, intellectual investigation, evidence, these determine both our individual and communal well-being. The rabbis debate what is more important, study or deeds. They conclude that study is more important because it leads to deeds. Deeds might be the most important outcome, but we cannot get there without learning. Ideas precede action as lightning precedes thunder. First, the bolt of thought. Then, the rumble of action. Philosophy determines policy. The better our ideas, the better our deeds. The more just our ideas, the more just our deeds. La asok Torah to immerse in Torah, is not just to pick up a book. Not that there's anything wrong with that. In Judaism, there is a specific way to learn. 
The sages meant a method of investigation driven by reason, debate, argument, persuasion, logic, evidence, proof. The assumption that no one person, one group, one political party, one class, one association, one professor, one rabbi, as a monopoly on truth is at the center of the Jewish tradition. The Jewish way, taught and retaught for thousands of years, is that we grow, we get smarter, we improve by learning from and interacting with those who disagree. Jewish tradition celebrates when people debate in good faith, when they differ with each other in pursuit of truth. Kol machloket shehil Hashem shamayim sofali kayem, the sages teach. Every disagreement that is for the sake of heaven, in pursuit of understanding, is destined to endure. Jews do not avoid a debate. We actively seek it out. We do not take offense if you disagree. To the contrary, we are offended if you too readily agree. There is a remarkable intellectual humility at the heart of Judaism, an acknowledgment that without you, I cannot learn. And without me, you cannot understand. We need each other. This classically Jewish approach to learning is also the fundamental assumption of Western liberalism. It is one reason Jews do well so well in free societies. Free inquiry, free expression, the ability to freely research and promote a broad spectrum of opinions is at the center of the Western tradition. Medieval authorities persecuted Galileo. The Enlightenment celebrated scientific inquiry, even if it conflicted with religious authorities or angered powerful establishments. It's extraordinarily gratifying to me that our tradition practiced and preached intellectual pluralism from the beginning and that our own sages preceded the giants of the liberal enlightenment by thousands of years. Judaism is emphatic, persuasion, vigorous challenge, openness to debate, a willingness to reconsider when new evidence emerges. These are the tools of the intellectual trade and the prerequisites for social progress and communal decency. Reflexive dismissal of another opinion insults us. Who is wise, Benzoma asked. One who learns from all people. Jews argue over everything. Our sacred texts explode with disagreement. You can hardly even open one page of Talmud without encountering numerous debates on seemingly minor matters. The Talmud records 316 separate disputes between the schools of Hillel and Shammai. Jewish tradition eventually resolved most of these disputes in favor of the school of Hillel. And the Talmud explains on what basis do we prefer one view over another? The law follows the rulings of the school of Hillel because they were modest. They studied not only their own rulings, but those of Shammai as well. The school of Hillel was so humble that they mentioned the, their rulings, the rulings of their opponents, before their own. They were so eager to contemplate and analyze the other side's opinions 
because they knew that by doing so, it would strengthen their own ideas. So if in most cases, Hillel's approach prevailed, why even record Shammai's views? First, as an example, if the greatest of the great sages were open to counter arguments, you too should keep an open mind. Do not think you are always right. Maybe someone else has something to teach you. Second, Shammai's views were preserved to leave room for future generations to make up their own minds. No solution is good for all times. Every problem lends itself to additional problems that require fresh thinking. If we preserve minority views, future generations will learn from them and perhaps even accept them. Third, to demonstrate how we can argue with each other and still remain united, we can have unity without uniformity. Only the insecure are afraid of challenge. To paraphrase Churchill, a little mouse of disagreement crawls into the room and even the mightiest potentates are thrown into a panic. They are afraid of the workings of the human mind. The traditional Jewish approach to learning, investigation, and ideas is this. Do you recognize that the other side also has something important to say? Is your mind open to research and persuasion? Do you pursue principle or power? Are your disputes for the sake of heaven or personal ambition? Are you interested in unity, in preserving the integrity of society? Do you pursue the common good? Or are you busy delegitimizing the other side? God weeps for those who have the potential la'asok betorah to engage in this kind of study, but do not. Institutions of learning, teachers, thought leaders, are critical to shaping communal character when they no longer commit to and insist upon the liberal discipline, we are in trouble. Two, God weeps for those who are unable to engage in Torah and do. Why would God weep for those who are unable to study, who are incapable but make the effort nonetheless. We should praise them for trying since learning is so fundamental to human life. One commentator explains that the sages were not referring to those who do not have the intellectual capacities but still do their best to learn. For them, God weeps, weeps bechia shel simcha, tears of joy. Rather, what the sages meant was the type of people who are incapable of intellectual pluralism but study and teach nonetheless. They populate the great academies of study and learning. Some people might be brilliant, but they are arrogant. They think they know everything. They consider you worthless, either a moron or hopelessly immoral. They cavalierly cancel and dismiss. Every time I publish an article, every time I do something that's in the news, I don't even read the comments, but from time to time when I have five or ten minutes, I like to read the reactions of people. Oh my God. The cesspool that is the internet, the reactions, 
completely intolerant, completely unable to receive any thought that differs from their own. Now, some of these people might be brilliant, but they use their intelligence not as a tool of persuasion, but a cudgel of intimidation and capitulation. One of the disputes between Hillel and Shammai lasted for three years. Three years. Back and forth they went, arguments and counterarguments. Finally, a heavenly voice descended to the earth proclaiming, Elu ve Elu divrei Elohim chayim. These and these are both the words of the living God. It is a machloket l'shem shamayim. It is a debate for the sake of heaven, for the pursuit of truth and understanding. And even if one opinion is eventually accepted, both reflect the words of the living God because both sides were sincere, open, honest, tolerant, and intellectually pluralistic. Imagine in our contemporary culture wars that a partisan from one side would concede that the arguments on the other side have merit. You would lose your place in the tribe. Social media would excommunicate you. Your peers would turn on you. If you were in an academic institution or a newspaper, they might seek to remove you, fire you, or force you to confess transgression, the 21st century version of the church's persecution of Galileo. God weeps for these people. They are dangerous. There is coercion in their character, domination in their disposition. Jewish lore describes the last two Jews in a small village. They hated each other and bickered constantly. Eventually, one of the two died. And when the survivor was asked how it felt to be the last Jew in the village, he responded, finally, I can run the community as I want. We must be careful of those who want to run the community as they and they alone want who tell us with certainty that they have discovered the answer to everything. There's something fearful about them. They simmer with the flames of hubris and boil with the heat of certainty that liquefies reason. Even the most brilliant of us see the world only in fragments. People prone to all-inclusive theories are not usually in search of truth they are in search of themselves. For this reason, Judaism warns us not to vest too much power in one centralized authority. The biblical tower of conformity came crashing down. God scattered the people of Babel, instilling different languages and customs. It's a cautionary tale. God does not want uniformity. God wants a cacophony of voices, babble. God wants diversity. Freedom cannot long endure without the free exchange of ideas. The liberal task is to expand freedom. Build a tower of oppressive censorship, whether imposed from the outside or self-imposed, and freedom will eventually collapse. If liberty means anything at all, wrote George Orwell, it is the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. Somewhere inside all of us, there is the instinct to dominate and the urge for power. Therefore, we must take great care to temper the reflex to dismiss, to cancel, 
excommunicate, subjugate, intimidate, especially in institutions devoted to free thought, bastions of the liberal order, like schools, universities, newspapers, publishing houses, the arts, theater, film, culture. We should revel in our differences, arguing loudly with each other how best to live, because diversity is a good thing. It is the lifeblood of liberty. This knee-jerk readiness to censor and cancel leads to authoritarianism. There's only one authority, one politically correct speech, one acceptable language. We know where this leads. We have seen it before. We lived it before. In the horrors of ideologies were, that were convinced that they and they alone discovered the one solution to the world's problems. They are about the search for power more than the search for truth. One ring to rule them all, one ring to bind them, one ring to bring them all, and in the darkness bind them in the land of Mordor where the shadows lie. All absolutisms are dangerous, whether from the right or from the left. They come from the same place, the same dark hole in the human soul where the shadows lie. All extremisms are a threat. An extremist mindset ultimately destroys that which it seeks to uphold. To be ultra is to go beyond, wrote Victor Hugo. It is to attack the scepter in the name of the throne. It is to maltreat the thing you support. It is to be the partisan of things, of the point of becoming their enemy. It is to be so very pro that you are con. It would be a boring world and a primitive one if we all walked in lockstep with each other and agreed with each other all the time. There are, of course, limits. Nothing is limitless in human affairs. Only God is without limits. Some views are beyond the pale. I will not dignify anti-Semitism or racism simply because you assert it. But the increasing tendency in 21st century America to affirm one acceptable answer, one legitimate view, is profoundly illiberal, even if it comes from the left. Come, let us reason together, Isaiah urges. Freedom is messy. Healthy societies are full of noise. I remember my visits to the former Soviet Union immediately after the disillusion. There was an eerie quiet on the streets. It was palpable. Suppression is quiet. Freedom is turbulent. Avoid the temptation to diminish, devalue, or disgrace those who disagree with you. It is not the Jewish way. While the articulation of principle may be straightforward, implementation is always complicated, confounding, and complex. Do not assume that those who differ with you on how to reduce poverty, how to preserve and extend civil rights, how to establish the most effective police force. Do not assume that those who disagree with you are manifestly and morally malignant, indisputably and incontrovertibly ignorant, or parsimoniously privileged and prejudiced. 
fundamentalisms flourish in both religious and secular settings. Some now argue with a straight face that the Enlightenment itself, liberalism itself, science, reason, logic, are constructs imposed on the world by white European colonial patriarchal and racist societies in order to subjugate others. Now I need to tell you when intellectuals voice ideas that strike you as bizarre, they are the wacky ones, not you. As Clive James wrote, when scholarship, academia, and language get beyond shouting distance of ordinary speech and ideas. Voodoo is all it is. I'm a liberal. Liberalism is progressive by nature. We believe in change. We believe in persuasion. We believe in reason. We believe that society can improve. We believe in social repair. We are not hopeless and we are not helpless. Generation after generation, brick by brick, we continue to build a more perfect union. There is a troubling temperament in some elements of the contemporary left that we have seen before. They have lost faith in persuasion, consent, and consensus. They believe in breaking things. We must smash, obliterate the system in order to construct a new society. The existing system is beyond repair. That's why parts of the new left are so opposed to Israel. They view the Jewish state through the prism of race and white privilege. Never mind that they are completely ignorant of the fact that most Israeli Jews are what we would call today Jews of color. They are not white, European. They are Semitic, Middle Eastern. And never mind that the descendants of most Israeli Jews were so unprivileged that they fled to Israel, penniless refugees victims of vicious racism in Europe and harsh oppression by fellow Semites in the Middle East. Do not give in. Do not be intimidated. Fundamentalists, religious and secular, assume that the other side is vapid, filled with unbelievers. They wrap themselves in garments of virtue while presuming that everyone else is morally naked, stripped of values. They clothe themselves in vanity, not virtue, a kind of pubescent self-righteousness. I do not doubt the sincerity, conviction, or sense of duty of parts of the new left, but these are qualities that, when misguided, become odious. Stand up for yourselves. And I say this to you, students at universities, stand up for yourselves. Kneel before no one. Defy those who demand obedience on pain of excommunication. The price of liberty is eternal vigilance. Three, God weeps for leaders who lord it over the community. What do arrogant leaders have to do with the first two Talmudic categories? I'm glad you asked. I'll tell you. 
when those who are uniquely suited to guide intellectual progress do not, and when those who are not suited to guide intellectual progress do, what you get is arrogant, shallow leaders who lord it over the community. Leaders reflect the people. They don't simply pop up out of the blue. They are not aberrations. They emerge from us, our culture, our education, our politics. As the generation, so the leader, the Talmud teaches. The Hebrew word that the sages use is mitga'eh. It implies not only arrogance, but false pride. They puff out their chests, convinced that they are above everyone else. They think they know more than they do. I alone can fix it, they say. I know more than the doctors. I know more than the generals. I am a stable genius. I recruit the best people. I am the only thing standing between the American dream and total anarchy, madness, and chaos. They don't just say these things for political reasons. They sincerely believe them. And because they don't know that they don't know, they are exceedingly dangerous. God weeps not only for the individual leader, but for the community that is led by such individuals. Good leaders do something religious in nature. They appeal to our better angels. They know that human beings emerged from the jungle and that we are always on the cusp of relapse. Wise leaders understand that it does not take much to stimulate our primitive animalistic instincts and so stimulated we are capable of a depravity that no other creature on earth can even imagine. The lion tears the zebra to shreds for food. It would never occur to it to waterboard its prey or to shackle it in chains of bondage because of the color of the stripes of its skin, to gas millions of them in the name of the master race of lions. Good leaders seek to elevate us beyond our narrow self-interest and to bind us to a higher cause. They know that it is much easier to destroy than to build. Tis easy dropping stones in wells, but who shall get them out? Wrote George Eliot. Jeremiah lamented, Hoy roim me'abdimum fitzim et son mariti. Woe unto the shepherds who let my flock stray and scatter. It is you, the shepherds, the leaders, the ones who should know better. It is you who lost the sheep and drove my flock away. We brought our leadership on ourselves. We have so devalued science, evidence, logic, facts. We are so intolerant, so dismissive, so eager to cancel the other that tens of millions of Americans have lost their way. They are unmoored from both the right and the left. We mock expertise and dismiss science. There are as many anti-vaxxers on the left as the right. Where did we learn that? In school? University? Social media? 
there are as many conspiracy theorists on the left as on the right. For every right-wing bigot convinced that Jews conspire to control the world, so there are left-wing bigots convinced that Zionists conspire to control the world. For every right-wing radical who boycotts Jewish-owned businesses, so there are left-wing radicals who boycott Israeli-owned businesses. For every right-wing campus agitator canceling Jews from leadership, so there are left-wing campus agitators canceling Jews from leadership. In fact, on campus, canceling Jewish students is probably more prevalent on the left than on the right. Philosophically, these groups may be miles apart but they share the same intolerant, turbulent, tempestuous temperament. And it often leads them to the same dark place. The outer edges of the left and the right fold together, and they end up with the same hatred of Jews. So many from both the right and the left no longer seek truth and understanding. They seek acceptance, a place in the tribe, shelter from the harsh world outside. If the leader of the tribe tells them that we can kill the coronavirus by ingesting Drano, millions listen. And what they hear is that the doctor knows nothing the medicine man will cure. A country that hauled the world into the 20th century, saved Europe twice, defeated fascism, imperialism, and communism, a great nation, an exceptional nation that practically invented modern technology, cured disease, landed humans on the moon, America first in science, first in research, first in public health, first in technological innovation. How in the heck did we become an America first nation? The state of American politics today is the result of year after year, decade after decade of intellectual and political neglect. It did not happen overnight. Hosea warned, Ki ruach izra vesufata iktsoru. They sow the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. For years, we have sown the seeds of intolerance. We have allowed the foundations of liberal democracy to crumble. And now, the gathering storm. Emily Dickinson wrote, crumbling is not an instance act, a fundamental pause. Dilapidations processes are organized decays. Tis first a cobweb on the soul a cuticle of dust and elemental rust. Ruin is formal, consecutive and slow. Fail in an instant, no man did. Slipping is crash's law. We have been slipping for years. Organized decays, consecutive and slow, cobwebs, on the American soul. Sadly, we are paying the price of failing to clear the cuticles of dust and the elemental rust. We can change America. We can reverse its slow decay. 
but we must be willing to fight for what is right. If we do not summon the resolve, God will weep, and the rest of us will cry for the beloved country. We must be willing to stand up to intimidation from wherever it comes. We must be willing to fight for our principles. We must reject extremism on all sides. We must be willing to vote. All you young people, we must be willing to vote. We must be willing to engage and to keep at it year after year, as crumbling is not an instant act, so rejuvenation is not immediate. Do not lose hope. Vahakimoti alehem roim, prophesied Jeremiah. Good shepherds will rise again. They shall tend to the flock with compassion and care. All the lost sheep will return. None will be missing. Keep the faith. The American dream is alive. It is still alive. The torch of liberty will pierce the shadows. We will find the dark grown luminous, the void fruitful. We can do it. America is capable of miraculous regeneration. It is not too late. It is never too late for America. We can change. Franz Kafka wrote a haunting short story called A Little Fable. It's one paragraph long, so I will conclude my remarks by reciting it in full. Alas, said the mouse, the world is growing smaller every day. At the beginning, it was so big that I was afraid. I kept running and running, and I was glad when I saw walls far away to the right and to the left. But those long walls have narrowed so quickly that I am in the last chamber already, and there in the corner stands the trap that I must run into. You only need to change your direction, said the cat, and ate it up.